So our next speaker is Wendy Green, who's an assistant professor here at Emory University. She's been here for about a year now. Um, sorry, associate professor at Emory University in, in our department of surgery um, as a surgical intensivist. And she's going to talk to us about the surgical critical care year in review. Thank you, Wendy. You're very welcome. I'd like to thank the organizers of the Southeastern Critical Care Summit for the opportunity to present this information regarding uh, topics that are very uh, interesting to me and I hope that you will enjoy. As you can imagine, in, in going over the entire surgical critical care, it involves not only emergency general surgery, uh, critical care, and trauma. I have no conflicts, but I would like to thank my co-authors uh, from the surgical section of the Society of Critical Care, Medi uh, critical care Medicine uh, who helped and provided some of the slides. As you can imagine, emergency general surgery is a, a varied topic and has great interest. If you look at the uh, IV antibiotic management and intra-abdominal infections, you think about the skin and the surgical site infections and how common a problem that is in our community. And then you think about the deep space organ infections and how that also is driving up the cost of health care today. So you can imagine that there have been a number of groups that have come together to try to figure out strategies to help us deal with these infections. We know that this is a common problem throughout the United States and that also is a very costly problem. We know that uh, surgical site infections account for about 20% of all hospital acquired infections in hospitalized patients. So this is a significant problem. As you can imagine, that if this is a big problem, there's going to be lots of studies to try to help us sort out these considerations. Therein lies this particular article that I found of great interest. Trial of short course antimicrobial therapy for intra-abdominal infection. Stop it. Yes, I said stop it. The study to optimize peritoneal infection therapy. In this study, they compared two strategies guiding the duration of antimicrobial therapy for the management of complicated intra-abdominal infection. We realize that the successful treatment of intra-abdominal infection requires a combination of anatomical source control and antibiotics. But how long should we keep those antibiotics? The appropriate duration remained unclear. Therein lied the interest in the study. They randomized 518 patients with complicated intra-abdominal infection and adequate source control to receive antibiotics until two days after the resolution of fever, leukocytosis, and ileus with a maximum of 10 days of therapy, the control group, or to receive a fixed course of antibiotics, the experimental group, for four plus or minus one calendar days. Their primary outcomes were composite of the following. Surgical site infection, recurrent intra-abdominal infection, or death within 30 days after the index source control procedure according to the treatment group. The secondary outcome included the duration of therapy and rates of subsequent infections. They found the following. There was no difference between those two groups, 21 versus 22 percent. Uh, the only difference was that the days were shorter or longer. That sounded pretty good. So, and there wasn't any increase in death between the groups. That's even better. So now we're looking at these two groups and we're saying, well, if we have adequate source control, the outcomes after fixed duration of antibiotic therapy, approximately four days, were similar to those after a longer course. So now you can feel comfortable telling your surgical colleagues to stop it. They can do it, it is safe. Moving on to the open admin, as you can imagine, this is a problem that has, uh, that has occurred as a result of us trying to manage and resuscitate patients, not only in the trauma scenario, but in those complex abdominal patients that come in and they need source control, but they can't close their abdomen because their bowel is too distended. There's some ongoing infection that may not be quite controlled. And you want to figure out, what do I do next with these patients? And so they've generated a whole nother set of problems. As a result, the role of the open abdomen procedure in managing severe abdominal sepsis has, they've created a position paper through the World Journal of Emergency Surgery. They looked at the open abdomen and they identified this as those abdomens that have been intentionally left open. And what is the role of the open abdomen and maybe those patients with severe peritonitis? So this may not be just your trauma patient, but now in this patient who's had severe bowel edema for some other intra-abdominal catastrophe. 
And they wanted to figure out how could we apply this to and, and the management of these patients. They felt that it would be important because you can allow for early identification of draining any residual infection, control of any persistent uh, source of infection, remove more effectively infected or cytokine-loaded peritoneal fluid, and prevent abdominal compartment syndrome, which has become a problem in our ICUs. So as a result, they felt that good principles to be followed um, would be leaving the abdomen open in these patients who have severe abdominal sepsis, and they wanted to encourage those to continue on with that practice. Moving on with small bowel obstruction. Now we know that this is a problem. Anybody who's had a surgical abdomen, been cut on for any reason, can develop a small bowel obstruction. Those adhesions, we never know how deadly they might be, but they are a problem. There's a 9% incidence of small bowel obstruction following any abdominal surgery. The complications can lead to not only prolonged fasting and requiring TPN, metabolic derangements, and life-threatening bowel ischemia. We know that the recurrence rates approach 80% in patients with multiple previous operations. And the socioeconomic and financial burden is costly. Not only that, but we have reported in-hospital mortality rates between 2 to 8 percent. Therein lies the in investigation for small bowel obstruction and how we can make a difference and a dent in this problem. So a multi-institutional prospective observational study of small bowel obstruction, clinical and computerized uh, uh, CT predictors of which <laughs> patients may require early surgery has been, had came out. And what they, their goals were was to identify clinical and CT predictors of which patients may need early surgery, to evaluate the utility of common CT findings. We have to know which patients we need to operate on earlier and who can wait. So with this multi-institutional study, patients who were admitted with small bowel obstruction uh, were, were included in the study. Those that were excluded were those who had small bowel obstruction were not managed conservatively initially, were within 30 days postoperatively. They excluded those who had external hernia, small bowel tumor, or intussusception, or those who were related to Crohn's disease. They looked at the clinical and laboratory variables, and the CT findings were interpreted by a blinded radiologist. And then they did the multiple, multivariable regression analysis to identify significant predictors. With these 200 patients with bowel obstruction, they were common, uh, their ages in around 60, or 50% male. And of these patients, they identified the most predictive factors. No phlatus. That's good. So the first question that you need to ask is, have you passed gas? It's an important thing. It makes us smile when we know that our patients have passed gas. There's a reason for that. Uh, we want to look on the CT scan and see if there's any presence of fluid. That was significant, as well as evidence of a high-grade obstruction. So if you see your colleagues waiting too long and they have these predict particular identifiers, you need to tap on them and say, I think we have some of those clinical indicators that were presented in that multi-institutional trial. We might want to consider getting that patient to the operating room sooner than later. And you can imagine that uh, the, the data supported all of this. So in conclusion, there was one clinical and two CT predictors identified which bowel obstruction patients may benefit from an early surgical intervention. Going on, continuing on with the small bowel obstruction, people want to study this. It's a problem. We know that the impact of introduction of an acute surgical unit on management and outcomes of small bowel obstruction is important also. When you set up an acute surgical unit, that means that you have an emergency general surgical team that is dedicated to emergency surgical procedures that patients may have, and they wanted to find out whether these patients would have improved outcomes uh, as a result of that. So the Australian group set up this uh, study to evaluate whether this shared, whether this uh, setup, this unit setup would be beneficial. This was a retrospective review of prospectively maintained databases over two separate two-year separate two periods before and after the introduction of the units and they identified that the, uh, that the outcomes in these patients were significant. The ones that they found that the mortality decreased and patients increased, that there was increased number of operations. So having this dedicated unit increased the throughput through the institution and got patients to the operating room sooner.
They've studied this in gallbladder disease, they've studied it in appendicitis, and now we're studying it in small bowel obstruction patients. So all the data is pointing to that having an emergency general surgical team, an acute surgical unit, is important in the throughput of care. As we go along and look at our trauma and critical care literature, we look at the acute kidney injury in the abdominal surgery. We wanted this particular paper looked at the incidence and association of acute kidney injury after major abdominal surgery. The purpose was to understand what complications occurred as a result of patients uh, in, who had major abdominal surgery and the impact of acute kidney injury. And what they identified was that acute kidney injury occurred in about 13% of the patient, and that post-operative acute kidney injury was 12.6-fold more indicative of the relative risk of death. So these patients who develop this acute kidney injury are, have worse outcomes. So now, although they just described this, we now need to go back and go forward and identify our patients and see how we can now prevent acute kidney injury realizing that these patients will have a worse outcome. Going on to nutrition. Looking at the trial, the PERMIT trial group looked at permissive underfeeding or standard enteral feeding in critically ill adults. They identified that patients who uh, have permissive underfeeding, which as compared to those who have a, a standard enteral feeding, which was characterized as 40 to 60% of calculated calories, nutrients, or standard enteral feeding, which was 70 to 100% of the calories for up to, up to 14 days, uh, while maintaining a similar protein intake in these two groups, was there any difference? They looked at that and they identified that there were no adverse, serious adverse events that occurred between these two groups. There was no significant between group differences with respect to feeding intolerance, diarrhea, infections acquired in the ICU. So they concluded that enteral feeding to deliver a moderate amount of non-protein calories to critically ill adults was not associated with lower mortality than associated uh, with planned delivery of a full amount of non-protein calories. So we may not have to go overboard in our patients or be overly concerned about the outcomes in our patients if we are giving them enough of the, the, the non-protein calories, but make sure that we're getting adequate proteins to our patients. And of course, you can't get out of a, tra a trauma and critical care talk without talking about transfusion and coagulopathy. Of course, the proper trial, pragmatic, Random, random, randomized optimal platelet and plasma ratios. In this group, uh, we wanted to identify among the patients with severe trauma and major bleeding and administration of plasma, platelets, and red blood cells in a one-to-one -one ratio compared with a one-to-one -to, -one to two ratio did not result in significant differences in mortality at 24 hours. So we can be more pragmatic with, or more judicious with our use of blood and blood products as a result of, use, of some of these studies now, realizing that the outcomes uh, were not different in those groups. Looking at the uh, PROMIT trial, recursive partitioning identifies greater than four units of packed red blood cells per hour as an improved massive transfusion definition. As you can imagine, when we're studying patients, if we're all using different definitions, we can't, uh, we're comparing apples to oranges. So we're trying to come up with a, a better definition of what is massive transfusion. And this is what this trial was doing for, the, for us. And we identified that patients who were placed in rate-based transfusion groups by a maximal number of packed red blood cells, blood cells transfused in any hour within the first six hours, that patients receiving less than 13 units per hour their mortality was significantly higher. And they identified that four units per hour identifies patients with significant mortality risk earlier. So we don't want to wait until they've gotten to the 13 units per hour. We want to pick those patients up earlier and say, this patient who's getting four units per hour is at increased risk for mortality and that we should put them into the massive transfusion group and not wait and define them later on. Any questions?
Thank you very much.